Ah, hi there, welcome back to Mudwalkers. My name is Chris. If you're not already subscribed here on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It helps me a lot. We're getting close to 800 subscribers, which is a big step. If we can get to 1,000, I can start, you know, considering thinking about monetization. So if you'd like to support me financially, it's actually free if you press the subscribe button. But also, if you'd like to actually send me real money, you could go to patreon.com slash mudwalkers, link in the description below, and uh, support me directly there. We have great affordable options, $5, $10 and up. And um, yeah, it's great. Also, check out the link tree. So in our culture, we don't have honor. No, I don't mean, wow, I'm so honored. I mean honor with a capital H, like samurai honor. Like honor. Their honor, the honor, my honor. My honor, my honor, honor, my honor. Oh, my honor, my honor, my honor, my honor, your honor, honor. So because honor isn't a part of our culture, we tend not to understand it. I'm not claiming to understand the honor system either, to be clear. Um, as a Westerner who didn't grow up in an honor culture, uh, I'm not sure I ever will understand it. But I, I'm, I'm starting to. I think I understand it better than I used to. Um, I'm getting there. It's a, it's a journey, not so much a, uh, a step. It's not like you are going to be reading a book and then go, ah, that's what honor is. No, 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 no. It's, it's more complicated than that. It's, it's a whole different mindset about life. So um, it, when, we, when we get into passages like this one, it's easy for us to see it from a Western perspective when what's actually going on is something very Eastern and foreign to our mode of thought as a Western culture. Many of us have heard the story of pff, King David re-entering Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant and dancing before the Lord. But there's a lot of disagreement among Christians about what exactly David was wearing. The text does say he was clothed in a linen ephod, which is, you know, key, it's important. But it doesn't say what he was not wearing, which is also key. So we, we can't say for sure he was only wearing a linen ephod, I think. But we do know that he was at least wearing a linen ephod. It's kind of like saying, uh, I saw Bob go into Walmart and Bob was wearing a hat. Well, it doesn't mean Bob was naked and he was wearing a hat. What it means is that among the things that Bob was or was not wearing, Bob definitely had a hat on. So let's keep that in mind as we read the passage. Me personally, I think that David was probably wearing a simple linen garment, something that would have been fit for travel or combat. Um, not so much the lordly robes of a king. Um, would have been great for combat, but in this case, of course, rigorous exercise. Maybe he was wearing royal robes for this, but I doubt it. We'll get into that in a minute. Before we go on, here's the actual passage. Okay, an ephod is essentially a little poncho that has a hole for your head, and it hangs in front, and it, it hangs on your back. And the kind of dancing David was doing, the word for dancing here is karar. I know I'm butchering that pronunciation. It's probably karar or something. But uh, because I'm not real well versed in Hebrew pronunciation, I'm just going to go full American and say karar. The word karar means twist or rotate. Okay, as for my source here, I confess that I've forgotten and misplaced the source. But I'm pretty sure, pretty sure, not certain, but pretty sure, that I, I got this interpretation either from the Bema Discipleship podcast by Marty Solomon or... Uh, Dr. David Falk from the YouTube channel Ancient Egypt and the Bible. I really wish I could cite the source here, and I tried for hours to find the source. If you know the source, please tell me. But uh, to my shame, I could not find it. So uh, just, I'm hoping that I'm crediting the right people, but maybe I'm not. And maybe you're, you know, watching this video years in the future, and I've found the source, and it's in the description below. But I don't have that yet. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. All that to say that this isn't my own idea. Uh, I didn't come up with it. Um, I, I learned it from some, someone else. So imagine for a second, it's the year 3023. For context, it, it's 2023, present day when I'm recording this video. So imagine you're living in the year 3023 and you read an article about this ancient musician named 
Mikhail Jakashon, or Michael Jackson, or however his name was really pronounced. No one really knows. And so he was on the stage and he was famous for his dancing. But hang on. You go and you find out that there was this ancient English word called moonwalking. And in the, you know, English translations, uh, one of the definitions you find there is dancing. Moonwalking is dancing. <laughs> For those of us who live this close to the 20th century, it's really obvious that moonwalking does not simply mean dancing. I mean, yes, <laughs> um, it, it is dancing, but it's a particular kind of dancing. So when we see the word karar, it, it, it does mean dance but it doesn't just mean dancing. It's a particular kind of dance. And the text says David was dancing with great exertion, so his skirts were probably flying all over the place. <laughs> just, just like, imagine that in your brain. Clearly David's wife um, was upset about what, what she saw, and uh, I think we have a few options about why. The first option is that um, she, she was a royal princess. Her father, Shaul, King Saul, was the first king of Israel, so she was accustomed to having a high honor status in Israel. And so when David goes uh, into Jerusalem, likely dressed as a peasant, but who knows, um, but definitely acting like a peasant, this, um, this diminishes his honor status from the top down to somewhere. We'll, we'll see what she says about it. Um, as we proceed, but uh, it diminishes his honor status, but because David is married to Michael, when his honor drops, so does hers. So it's understandable that she'd be upset. Wrong, but understandable. Number two, um, the, the upper classes in the ancient world were often accustomed to appearing in public fully clothed. Uh, to appear naked in public or underdressed would make you look like a peasant or maybe even a slave. And no self-respecting, self-honoring, upper-class person in the ancient world, especially in a time like the Bronze Age, would have appeared nude in public or even semi-nude. So for David to go dancing like this, to act in this way, um, is, is a big uh, social misstep by, by, his, by the culture standards. Because what he's essentially um, demonstrating by dancing in this way is that he doesn't believe himself to be above his people. He doesn't think he's better than them. He doesn't think that he's better than the peasants. Which again is a really, really odd behavior from a king in the Bronze Age. In his wife's words, Michael's words, he exposed himself in the sight of the slave girls. Which means essentially that he was acting like a slave in front of the slaves. Um, and he was essentially saying, like I said, that he, he wasn't better than these people, which is uh, kind of neat. He was making himself look less like a king and more like a peasant. Honestly, knowing David, uh, I wouldn't put that past him, being fine with looking like a peasant because he grew up as a peasant. I mean, for crying out loud, he was out shepherding the sheep and fighting wild animals. He was probably sleeping on the ground fairly often. So uh, the idea that David wouldn't think of himself as above the working class people strikes me as really plausible. This episode of Mud Walkers has been brought to you by my generous supporters over on Patreon. Shout out to Nature Him, Todd, Edward, John S, Joseph, Charlie, Lionheart, Nudist Lifer, Adam M, Edward T, Jay Good, Cyan B, John W, Clifton M, Nun Here, Marty, Austin S, Martin C, Benjamin M, JLDL, Corky S, Kenth L, John F, Jeremy H, Richard M, PJH, Tom L, David B, Joe S, Cedric, Chim M, and De Dennis R. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> Almost called you David. David, 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 Michael, 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 Dennis. Got it. Dennis. This episode has been brought to you by these guys. So, guys, thank you for what you're doing on Patreon. You're making my content possible. You're keeping my work sustainable. So, thank you. I cannot thank you enough for everything you're doing on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a patron, there's a link for that in the description below. We have really affordable tiers, $5 and up. And uh, the $10 option actually gets access to a monthly Zoom convert, monthly Skype conversation with me and the other $10 patrons. So um, it's a great time to get to hang out and swap stories, share ideas. It's a great time. It's my, honestly, it's my favorite part of having patrons is being able to talk to them once a month in a video conversation. I, I'm meeting people and hearing stories that I never would have gotten access to if I did not have Patreon. So uh, you guys are really improving my life uh, in more ways than one. But uh, back to the video.
Okay, this next part is going to require me looking specifically at the biblical text. Uh, so my wording has to be really precise here, so I'm going to use my cheat sheet. Uh, okay, so notice the language here employed by David and Michael. This goes over the heads of a lot of Western readers, I think, but it's very, very uh, obvious. Well, it's not that obvious, but I think it's pretty clear if you look at this from an honor perspective instead of a moral perspective. Look at that. Look at it through the lens of their culture. So Michael sarcastically opens with, Oh, how the king of Israel has honored himself today. She doesn't couch this in moral language. She couches it in honor language. She said, how the king of Israel has honored himself today. So right out of the gate, she doesn't accuse him of being wicked or evil or abominable. She accuses him of not being honorable. That's key. Then she continues, he exposed himself in front of the slave girls. Why is that significant? Why does that matter? Again, it's a socioeconomic statement. David is not assuming that he's actually better or deserving of more honor than the common people. I think that may go back again to David's own humble origins, but I digress. So if Michael was looking at this from a moral perspective, if she thought that what David was doing was immoral, then why would the socioeconomic status of these girls matter? Okay, hear me out. Here in America, it doesn't matter if I go streaking in front of a bunch of women uh, at a local church in the inner city or a bunch of female politicians in the Senate or anything like that. It doesn't matter, or the Queen of England for that matter. Evangelical Christians are just going to say that it's wrong, wrong, wrong no matter what. So why does Michael specifically say, not just that he exposed himself in the eyes of women, because there would have been lots of well-to-do wealthy women, maybe even uh, powerful women who were watching David dance, but Michael specifically says, the slave girls, the lowest of the low, socioeconomically speaking. That's significant. Because again, David's behavior is not befitting his royal honor status. Therefore, not Michael's either. His wife is essentially accusing him of behaving like a lower class, working class peon with no honor standards. He's daring to act as if he's his slave's equal. But David also replies with honor language. He says, this was done in the presence of Yahweh, who chose me instead of your father and his whole family and appointed me ruler over Yahweh's people, Israel. I will dance in Yahweh's presence and I will dishonor myself and humble myself even more than this. However, by the slave girls, you spoke about, I will be held in honor. They will honor me. So for David, this is about righteousness and humility, not about honor. His honor is secondary to his service to God and the goodwill of the people. But Michael sees this through an honor lens and David is seeing there's, there's something more important here. There's more at stake here than just his own reputation and his own social status. It's, it's about serving God and honoring the people that he rules over. But now, what if the passage had been written from a moral perspective? Let's take a look at that from the cheat sheet. Michael could have opened up with something like this. Behold the righteous deeds of the king of Israel, how he exposes his body to the women of the kingdom, the way an evil man exposes himself. And David replies with, I have done this in Yahweh's presence who appointed me king over our people. So it is not wickedness. And you're the only one who thinks this is a sin. Everyone else loved it. And you think this is sinful? I'll get even more when I'll get even more wicked and sinful than this. But as we saw, the passage couches this in honor language, not moral language. Michael accuses him of not living up to his honor status, and then David vindicates himself by pointing to his honor status in Yahweh's eyes instead of human beings. He's honoring Yahweh. That's what he's really getting at here. I am Yahweh's servant. I'm honoring him. David vindicates himself by pointing to his honor status in Yahweh's eyes and in the eyes of the very people that Michael mentioned in her accusation. David's response is essentially, I'm going to read this, David's response is essentially, the thing that you think dishonored me actually commends me to God. And on top of that, the people that you think make me less honorable are even now, at this moment, holding me in high esteem because of what I did today, so you have no basis for your bitterness whatsoever. Oh, and you think I'm acting below my kingly status right now? Ha! Just you wait, honey. Just you wait. I'll up my game very soon, then you'll really see me acting below my status. Just you wait. So Michael ends up depicted as kind of um, self-centered and uppity in this passage. David, on the other hand, is the righteous cultural nonconformist. He's righteous and she is honorable. Um, these are, these are they're to two totally different perspectives that are, that are colliding in this passage. 
But um, yeah, it's hilarious that the, the very same people that Michael uses as an argument against David's honor status are the people who were holding David in such high esteem. And it's ironic that she accuses him of um, being so dishonorable here, and then she ends up suffering uh, one of the worst dishonors a woman could possibly face, maybe even the worst in the Bronze Age, which is she became childless. Uh, she had conceived no children up to this point, and then the author goes out of his way in this passage to say that as a result of this interaction that day, Michael never conceived children. Now, was that because David was so angry with her that he refused to conceive a child with her? Maybe. It could also be that, that Yahweh stepped in and kept her from having children. Maybe. The passage doesn't say, so who are we to assert that with certainty? I don't know. I, I don't know. But despite the fact that Michael was by far David's most prestigious wife out of the several that he had at the time, um, she was not the one who gave birth to Solomon. Who did give birth to Solomon? A peasant. The wife of a military officer. That was Bathsheba. There's a whole passage about that complicated situation right here. So, who's really at fault here in this passage? I think you know what my answer is. A lot of people think that this passage is about nakedness and morality. But what the passage is really about is behavior and honor and the priority of your standing with Yahweh over your standing with human beings. Righteousness over honor, you might say. That's what the passage is really getting at. But most fundamentally, there's, there's no rule here given for all mankind. So without an actual like rule, you can't apply this passage to some kind of general concept of modesty. It just doesn't work. We go over that in the big question. Thanks for watching.